Hello friends, it's really good to have you along with us this evening. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us with Mission Matters and it's lovely for us tonight to welcome to Mission Matters uh, Eleanor Wallace. Eleanor uh, is the daughter of the founder of Acre Gospel Mission, Mr. McComb, and his wife Margaret, who went out to Brazil in 1937 and started the work of Acre. And it's lovely to have Eleanor with us this evening, and thank you for agreeing to join us for, for uh, Mission me. Matters tonight. Uh, we're, we're very excited about this and excited about what you're going to share with us uh, about your mom and dad and about the start of the work or what you remember maybe about the work uh, growing up as a child and with your mum and dad. That's more like it, Kate. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, it, it's really lovely to have you tonight. And also your husband, William, who's listening in the sidelines tonight as well. Thank you for allowing us into your home to do this this evening. Very welcome. Um, again, just to start off with, uh, we're, we're so thankful for the vision that your dad and your mum had also uh, to take the gospel out to Brazil. But going right back to the very beginning, can you share just a little bit about uh, when they came to know the Lord as their saviour? Dad, I believe, was a boy of about 14. He must actually have been older than that because he met at a meeting in Argyle Presbyterian Church a man called uh, Captain Gracie who had twice avoided the firing squad um, with the Bolsheviks in, in uh, Russia. He was apparently some secret service thing. Anyway, Dad heard this man giving his testimony and he was led to Christ through the witness of that man at the end of the service. That was that. Some years later, he uh, almost immediately after that, he got very interested in mission work, went to Northumberland Street Mission Hall, which was the outreach from Argyle Place and um, got very involved with the work there. There was a terrific bunch of people there and I think there was upwards of a dozen or more young folk of that era went to different mission fields. Um, I knew quite a few of them, which was a privilege, I must say, although as a child. Um, so where do I... Go on, how long to go on? About. Oh, what about your mum as well then? Mum um, <clears throat> became a Christian through the ministry of somebody called Gypsy Pat Smith. Mm -hmm. And she too became very involved in um, the work of Northumberland Street Mission Hall. Mm -hmm. So it was a, a great bunch of people. And of course, through the Mission Hall, she also met my father. Mm -hmm. So that was a different story, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> I have heard from a number of people who used to go to Northumberland Street mm -hmm. Mission Hall about God really blessing in those days oh, and yes. many folk coming to the Lord. And again, as you said, quite a number of the young people there who were really on fire for God uh -huh. and who eventually went to the mission field That's right. uh, to serve the Lord in different parts of the world. Yes, yeah. The, um, there were two of the Wright brothers, uh, including Fred, Mm -hmm. Joe I knew very well as a child. Mm -hmm. uh, Fred also went and was murdered by the, the Indians in Brazil. Mm -hmm. He was one of the three Freds, which is a very famous sort of group of young mm -hmm. men who were killed because of their faith and um, the Indians didn't like them. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, that was that. Then your dad heard a man called Fenton Hall Speaking in That's Northumberland. That's right. <laughs> the kind of army and, Navy and uh, Air Force. He was in the Air Force and mm -hmm. he spoke um, about the Brazilian Indians and mm -hmm. Dad got a tremendous call then mm -hmm. to go and work with these people. I have uh, an ancient concordance which was given to Fenton Hall in 1924. Mm -hmm. From the look of it, it went to the Amazon because it's obviously been water damaged. And um, I think it's really quite amazing what they carried out with them in those days. This mm -hmm. lovely thing with fine paper to the middle of the Amazon jungle. Mm -hmm. Sadly, Fenton Hall died a couple of years afterwards from dysentery. Mm -hmm. He wasn't killed by the Indians, but uh, 
his health took him. Mm -hmm. However, he spoke of the need and that really got my father interested in uh, going to Brazil. And then, uh, wasn't it 1924 that your dad left Northern Ireland to go to London? That's right. He went to a wonderful place called the Missionary Training College, mm -hmm. which worked on an army principle. It was as if they were in the army and I think they had to get up and have cold showers and stuff and parade around and do gym and all that. And then they had their breakfast some hours later mm. after they'd also had a time of uh, prayer and so on. Very tough. It was not a theological college. They wanted to train them to cope with hardships. Mm -hmm. I mean, they got Bible teaching as well, but that wasn't the primary thing. But my father formed friendships then and learned so much that were of terrific benefit to him later in the mission. So it certainly would have been, especially going to Brazil and yes. to the, the unknown, nearly, right. and as they called it in those days, the green hell. That I think Acre was certainly called yeah. that, yes. Yeah. And, uh, if you look even nowadays at the pictures of the Amazon, there's still a lot of green. Yeah, yeah, you're despite right. the logging and so on. Uh -huh. um, then uh, in 1925, he left Belfast to go off to to Brazil the first time. That's right. He um, what is now was then the heart of Amazonia mission uh, became known as WEC, right. Worldwide Evangelistic Crusade. He applied to them, was accepted, mm -hmm. and um, after some language study, Portuguese, he ended up with uh, Brazilian Indians. Some, the Amazon's a very long river, I don't know that people realise just how big it is, and Manaus is where he landed to, to um, do his language, and it's a thousand miles from the, the mouth of the Mother. river. So it, uh, then he had to go days and days and days and days on wee boats and canoes and all manner of launches and things to meet the Indians, mm -hmm. which was quite exciting for him. Uh, and some of the Indian tribes that he went to, um, people before him had gone and, and actually been murdered. That's right. Isn't that right? Yeah. yeah. Very short time before he arrived. So it mm -hmm. was a a wild and totally unknown, pretty unknown. Um, there was a, another army person, a Colonel Fawcett, who disappeared and I don't know that he was ever really worked out. Mm -hmm. And even yet in Brazil, in the forest, they're still coming across people who are living very primitive lives mm -hmm. and um, all these people need to be reached. Yeah, I remember on the news a, a couple of years back uh, showing aerial views yes. of um, a tribe and they were standing with their spears and whatever looking up at the the plane taking the photographs above them and I think that somebody said there was about seven or eight different tribes that still have not yeah, been right. reached uh, right. yet with they, the gospel. They don't really know I think just exactly yeah. what is going on at such vast territory. Yeah uh, um, I was reading that y your dad whenever he was getting onto the boat uh, 1925 shouted back to the people remember Macomb's big loaf because of Macomb's bakery in Belfast and told them to remember every time they saw the bread van yes. to, to remember to pray for him in, in the Amazon. It's interesting you say that because my husband said Eleanor mentioned Macomb's big loaf. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was even in, in, as a child at meetings and other things and long after that uh -huh. people would have said about Macomb's big loaf apparently it was a, a well-known baker. Bakery. Yeah, and, uh, it was a good. good way of remembering people. Well, that's folk right. Were, I mean, right. folk would have remembered him saying that as well. Absolutely. And, yeah. Uh, I, I was I was laughing because so, many folk have told me the story about how that your dad with some of the other missionaries were on the boat going to Brazil the first time, mm. and they got to know some of the Brazilian waiters, I think uh, Portuguese uh -huh. waiters, and yeah. they were chatting to them, and they brought down to the the table uh, two bowls of water and set them down yes. for them, and then. Uh, they, they sat and drank them and then the waiter came back with the two glasses of water and they didn't realise that the bowls were actually for washing their hands and yeah, yeah yeah oh but. dad used to tell that <laughs> frequently but they these were young uh, men who had really not much notion of yeah, yeah. anything and I remember another story which when they were um, somewhere 
I think probably the Port Stewart Convention and one chap had encountered prunes which he hadn't had before <laughs> Right. and they ended up counting 17 <laughs> prune stones right, right. late which um, could have caused him quite a bit of bother uh, you're things, right you know, you're however right. that's beside the point well previous to your dad going out of course he met uh, a, a lady called margaret mcknight she and uh, they fell in love that's right it was uh, it was what you call a long distance relationship <laughs> yes apparently they were secretly engaged when he went to brazil they weren't supposed to be because right. Uh, his the mission that he was in uh, didn't really appreciate uh, stuff like that going on <laughs> between missionaries mm -hmm. and um, however they they had a very strong attachment mm -hmm. and um, I'm one of the results of that uh, and then um, your your mum she she was a nurse yes she did nurse training and mm -hmm. midwifery mm -hmm. um, not as we would know it now you know for mm -hmm. three four four whatever years it is now mm -hmm. um but enough to get a good working knowledge especially of midwifery mm -hmm. which is very helpful and uh, she went to redcliffe bible school and then, then she went to redcliffe yes and H hetty smith also went there oh yes yes later and then she went off in 1929 to brazil um have to stop and think about that. Aye, that would be right. Yeah. Um, how I remember is they got married in 1931. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realise again until I was looking back in the book that they actually got married in Brazil. Oh, yes. Yes, I, I didn't realise that. picture in there to prove it, right. probably. Uh -huh. um, well, they'd waited long enough, Keith. They'd had to have a very long wait. The mission said they had to be in the mission field for two years before they got married. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, they were not allowed to be in the same place. So dad was back with the Indians and my mother was sent away over to the east of Brazil, mm -hmm. um, well away from it for two years. Mm -hmm. So as soon as they could prove, and mum had been accepted by the mission by this stage, of course, mm -hmm. uh, they got married. And that was the... As fast as they could. That was the start of a, a whole lot more then, of course, oh, yes. as well. The beginning of a big adventure. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Uh, so that was 1930. 31, they were married. One. Mm. Uh, then, can you tell us uh, how that ACRI started then? Because uh, uh, it was 1937, really, that they went back out again. Uh, no. Um, they worked with the Indians after they were married, uh -huh. still under WEC. Mm -hmm. And um, my sister, in fact, was born. Well, she was born in Manaus uh, for the simple reason that it was <laughs> more hygienic and better to be born there. Mm -hmm. uh, but as a baby, she was taken back to the jungle, mm -hmm. to these Indian tribes, which, when I think of it, trying to even to wean a child, a baby, on monkey. My mother used to say she remembered one of the, the fellow missionaries thinking it was very funny and um, when she was having morning sickness he pulled a monkey head out of the pot and said this will help we junior and mother was promptly <laughs> sick after that mm -hmm. as you would be however my sister did survive the I understand it was largely bananas she was weaned on um, but it must have been very very difficult mm -hmm. indeed in circumstances of poor hygiene as well as anything else poor food heat insects mm -hmm. i read in the book that even the condensed milk could turn to like toffee um, so it was so, so old yeah so he, he said i, I mm -hmm. don't remember such things uh -huh. i don't uh -huh. um, but um i believe it was really pretty bad and then then they, they came home didn't they um to northern ireland yes Dad, meantime, had got a uh, word from a culprator that he'd met of the need in in Acre, where there were no missionaries. Mm -hmm. And he felt very strongly that he should go. The mission also didn't think that he should. However, that was another story. What did you ask me? I forget. <laughs> yeah, just the it was the start of, of, of the work of yes. Acre. Gospel well, that was really, really it. Um, Dad eventually resigned 
and they decided that they would, my parents would go back to Acre. Mm -hmm. They, dad handed over any money that he had got, he gave it to Wick because he didn't feel he could carry it through. And a bunch of lovely men, businessmen in Belfast and Northern Ireland got together to work out how they were going to support this man, mm -hmm. not just prayerfully, but financially. Mm -hmm. And uh, that went along quite nicely, just in an informal business until the war started. And then they couldn't send out the money unless it went to an official um, entity. So <laughs> they went to their friendly bank manager, who was probably one of them anyway, and said, he said, well, tell me about this. Um, where is it? They said, Acre. Okay, and what is it? It's a gospel mission. He said, right, we'll call it the Acre Gospel Mission. Mm -hmm. And that was how it got its name, and they were able to get money sporadically. Um, didn't always arrive, but mm -hmm. there were dear good souls here working away to get it out mm -hmm. to support them, and with prayer, mm -hmm. which was always so important. Of course. Uh, yeah. And you've been very involved in the prayer meetings over the many, many years, and hosting well, a prayer meeting over many years as yes. well. Uh, I've been very privileged to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, at one stage two, two prayer meetings joined together and that really was I met such wonderful people through that and mm -hmm. real prayer warriors mm -hmm. that were, that really a privilege to, to do that and the mission have so much to be thankful for because of so many folk that pray for the work still today, you know, right. and, and again, as you say, prayed away back then yeah, that's right but going back to then, your mum and dad came home uh, for deputation, I think, and then they, did. they had to leave your older sister Irene here yes, in Northern Ireland. They did. Maybe you could tell a wee bit about that story. Yes, because they were going to an unknown place and they had no idea what they were facing, they didn't feel that they could possibly take my sister with them. Mm -hmm. She was three and a half at the time and two very dear friends I know my, my aunt and uncle, who were spinster and bachelor, they said they would take them, but um, this was a married couple with children of their own, and they um, said they would take a sister. And they loved her like their own, and mm -hmm. she's often said that she just was. There was never any difference. And eventually my parents got a letter to say, would it be all right if she called them daddy and mummy? Mm -hmm. Which she did. Um, because of World War II <clears throat> and the battle in the Atlantic and so on, they couldn't get home. Mm -hmm. And it was eight and a half years before they got home. Mm -hmm. Now, missionaries nowadays and since then have got schools to which their children could go. Mind you, they could still be a couple of thousand miles away. Mm -hmm. And some of my friends, as missionaries' children, went to boarding schools and, and homes in England for missionaries. Mm -hmm. Some of the children coped very well with that. Others never quite were able to feel that God had been very kind to them. Perhaps mm -hmm. that's a foolish way to put it. But anyway, um, my parents couldn't get home as I said and these dear folk looked after my sister and um, Molly Harvey used to talk about how my mother was so distressed mm -hmm. and she was on the boat. A huge her. sacrifice to make. And anybody with a child, a child who just didn't understand, mm -hmm. couldn't. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was, but missionaries do make big sacrifices mm -hmm. even now. Yeah. And. Uh, that's what I guess we're all called to do. Mm -hmm. Some of us don't do it quite so valiantly as others. Mm -hmm. So they went back to Brazil with Molly then at that stage? Yes, Molly had uh, met mum, got to Northumberland Street, was saved under the ministry of W.P. Nicholson. 
Anne got very involved in the work and mm. she became a full midwife and did mm -hmm. the proper training. Uh, so her work was invaluable mm -hmm. um, in Brazil. They went back with Molly and in many ways Molly was the second mother to me because I was born a couple of years after they went back and mm -hmm. mum was very ill and Molly looked after me and uh, we all lived together mm -hmm. uh, in in Boko to Acre and uh, she was just a second mother mm -hmm. and it was lovely. I was, I was telling Eleanor just before we started that uh, her dad announced that she was born uh, on the 14th of August, I'm allowed to say the year, okay, why not? <laughs> 1939 <laughs> at 1.30am, Eleanor, uh, what's your second name? Bailey. Bailey, yes, sorry, I should have written that one down, <laughs> but Eleanor Bailey was born, Eleanor Bailey McComb was born, and it says, bright blue eyes and lungs like pipe organs. <laughs> so there you are. That was a nice way to be announced into the world, wasn't oh, it? Oh, yes. <laughs> I was a good talker then, I still. Uh -huh. But your dad yes. and mum, of course, spent a number of years then after that in Brazil as well, and um, continued on with the work with Molly. They did. Um, and when they came home on furlough and shared about the, the great need there, God put it in the hearts of so many others to go to Brazil, like James and Dory and Fred Orr, and I, we could name so many names today. Um, uh, they could. Do you remember any of those early days or want to share anything with us about those earlier days? Uh, in Brazil or, or here? Yeah, well, either. Oh no, Brazil I remember silly things like uh, apparently I was a very picky eater and my dad for some reason used to stand at one end of the veranda and be the daddy bird feeding the baby bird and I had to run and take it off the spin oh, right. which was quite original actually uh -huh. and I should have long since been feeding myself however uh, I remember being at meetings in the open air mm -hmm. with my mum and Molly um, I particularly remember leaving Brazil when we finally the war ended and we were able to come home and we called in at Mawes, where my Uncle Joe's family was living, to say goodbye to them. Mm -hmm. And I must have realised then that I wasn't going to see them again, mm -hmm. probably. Because I remember crying and eventually actually going to the other side of the boat. I refused to sort of stand and wave to them, I think. Mm -hmm. Now, 70... But nearly 80 years later, 70 years, one of those cousins who lived in Rio until recently told me how much she had cried mm -hmm. when I had left and it was very interesting just finding that out. Mm -hmm. Uncle Joe left a couple of years after Dad worked with the Indians, mm -hmm. married a Brazilian, settled there. And I have a lot of relatives in Rio, São Paulo, Manaus, all over. Mm -hmm. uh, indeed, an awful lot of them I have no contact with because I couldn't know them all. Mm -hmm. But um, my memories of Brazil really may not even be true memories. They could be tainted by photographs. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I don't know, but I do certainly remember the meetings. Usually there were dogs around and maybe hens and things like that mm -hmm. um, in the open air. And people always coming to the house mm -hmm. and they stood and they clapped. Didn't matter what time of the day or the night. And Brazilians are very hospitable and, you know, you always would have attended. And then did I read that your dad was a good photographer? The day my dad had his last stroke before he died, Keith, he was uh, processing colour film, which is uh -huh. quite complicated. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yes, he was a great photographer and uh, he liked experimenting, experimenting. Uh -huh. Anyway, you said then about coming home, did I remember things? Yes. Remember dad was away a lot because he was doing deputation work. Uh -huh. And he um, packed his stuff in a cow hide sort of suitcase, mm -hmm. which weighed a ton in itself, you know, very heavy, sturdy thing. 
he took glass slides with them, four by four things in a box, which was very heavy. Mm -hmm. And there was a big metal black and brass lantern, magic lantern mm -hmm. thing, about this size. <laughs> All this was tucked into the suitcase, which my father humped on trains and buses. And mm -hmm. Sometimes people gave him a lift in a car, but in the 1940s and early 50s, there weren't that many cars mm -hmm. around. However, he did it gladly and um, enjoyed telling people about the work. Mm -hmm. Then we, uh, when he became secretary of the mission, we all as a family sat around the kitchen table. And uh, I remember the excitement when we got to 900 letters, mm -hmm. people wanting the, the, how many do you send out now? About two and a half thousand. Aye, well. 900 was a big one. You addressed every envelope behind. Uh -huh. <laughs> I wasn't allowed to do that because I wasn't a good enough writer for a long time. So I got sticking on the stamps uh -huh. Uh -huh. and maybe putting the things in. And then I advanced. However, that was a thing that we did. Uh -huh. No telephone for some time, which was a blessing because I distinctly remember, and I'm sure your family's the same, Keith. As soon as you sat down to your tea, once there was a phone, people knew that they'd get you. <laughs> at, lunch, at tea time, that's right. And of course, now that they're mobile phones, they can get you any time. Uh -huh. In those days, um, that was... However, that was a great help too. Um, eventually, in 19... mid-50s, I guess, um, some dear souls who were fairly wealthy people bought dad a car mm -hmm. and he pretty much taught himself to to drive mm -hmm. <laughs> and drove and he was delighted with that it really meant a lot to him he didn't have to carry that big suitcase around and of course transparencies had arrived by then mm -hmm. which was a help and the little projector so uh, that was that was very good i have heard people saying in the past you know how excited they were to go and to see those glass lanterns oh, and, yes. uh, and they would have coloured the pictures in sometimes as he well when they painted he, them in. He and coloured, they used glass paints. For people to see those uh -huh. and, and be taken to the other side of the world was such a, a big thing that we take for granted now. You just click a button on the computer and you're there within a second. Exactly. You know, and, and yeah. certainly to go to the Amazon and Acre yeah. and all these places just to click a button and you're there and right. see live cameras in some of these places and actually be there live. Uh -huh. um, it's, it's amazing today, isn't it? it, it. The technology. And I, I often sit and think about your mom and dad and Molly and, you know, James and Dory, all the others. If if they could just be with us today to see what's happening in Brazil and what God's doing there today. Yes. And of course, we're today reaping the benefits of their prayers uh, way, way back then. It was wonderful. Really, the Acre Mission would not have, have continued, mm. I suspect, had not Molly gone out. Dad and Mum, when they finally came home in 1945, couldn't, weren't allowed back because of their health. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Molly still felt the call and she went back by herself, mm -hmm. single woman, which was a tremendous thing. And she was joined a wee bit afterwards by James and Dory Gunning, which was a, also a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, then after that, there was a steady supply of missionaries. We've been chatting about sicknesses there and, uh, you know, again, some of the things that, that the missionaries came through, the sicknesses that they had. Uh, and again, I remember reading about your, your dad lying in the hammock and the rats running up the strings of the hammock and I, I wouldn't have been there if it had been me, I'd have been gone. It's amazing what God brought them through. Um, in, in the early days yeah. and right through and again the missionaries right up for many years um, the, the different things that they, they went through and, and how God provided for them and protected them through many different things and uh, again many sadnesses things absolutely. happened in the mission with, with with Fred and Ina yes indeed you, you maybe remember that I remember very clearly Fred and Ina are leaving for Brazil and at her farewell meeting, she sang, let me burn out for you, Lord. And um, it was 
not very long afterwards, a very short time afterwards, they'd arrived in Brazil and my dad came up stairs, mum was ill in bed and the look on his face, he, he just was absolutely overwhelmed to hear that Ina had died of a fever. Mm -hmm. And Ina is buried in Labria where there's a mission station now. Mm -hmm. God's really blessing in the church there yeah. in Labria with yeah. Pastor, Pastor Fabio Mar and his wife oh, yes. Marilini and uh -huh. uh, I haven't been there yet but oh, uh, yeah. to see the pictures and, and hear what's going on there you know yeah. and you often think if Ina or could see that today you know that verse except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die it abides alone that. and if she could see what what God has done yeah. through her death, absolutely. then I would say Ina would have said, oh, well, I'll die over and over again, you know, um, right. for the glory of God. Uh, it's amazing just what God has done down through the years. It really is. It and I'm sure your dad and mum, although they couldn't go back to Brazil, were, yeah. were so thrilled at seeing the work develop. Absolutely, absolutely. And how God has provided mm -hmm. over the years and financially, one memory I do have, they, they used to send out the little newsletter thing and one year at the annual account that went out, there was ten and sixpence in the balance. Mm -hmm. What's that? 50p? 50? 52p? I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's just over 50 pence. Right. Ten and six balance. At least uh -huh. they were, you know, they weren't overdrawn. Uh -huh. But God just so wonderfully provided. Mm -hmm. And I know you've been many a time at your wit's end wondering where the money was going to come from, Keith. Yeah, yeah. Cool. And it still goes on. It's, ama it's amazing, as you yeah. say, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, as, as a missionary of the past said, God's work done in God's way never lacks God's supply. Mm -hmm. uh, and certainly there have been times when it's been very difficult. Yes. Um, but yet God is faithful. There's never been a time when there's been nothing at all there. Oh. There's always been something. something. Yeah. And God has been so good to the work and the workers down yeah. through the years. Um, I, I love watching some of the old footage, Victor, Maxwell made a video many years ago, I think it was 1976, was it really? made a film uh, for my sake and showing some of the mm -hmm. footage of way back. Yeah. And I, I love the little bit the clip of your dad and we're hoping to put this on at the end of mm -hmm. our, 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 our time here tonight. Uh, but the, the clip of him and the whistle, and right. you have his whistle in your hand there. And maybe you could explain what that is. This is a little wooden possibly think that the Indians carried in the forest apparently and if they were lost they blew it. Now I have blown this thing in every direction I can think of. I cannot for the life of me work out how to make a noise out of it. Mm -hmm. Possibly there was a little bit of something in it, a wee bean or something. Mm -hmm. But anyway apparently this had a very, very piercing shrill sound and it carried over big areas in the forest and other Indians could hear it and come and find that lost person. Mm -hmm. So dad it seems carried that round with him. I don't actually, it sits in our china cabinet but um, it was quite a, quite a thing I think that people's lives depended on something as simple as that. Mm -hmm. I, I think the translation from Portuguese of that is the call of the lost Yes. That's the name of the That's whistle. Right. The call of the lost. Uh -huh. uh, uh, somebody was lost. Because uh -huh. um, he, does, he does say that on the video, you know, that he, he carried, he always carried that yes. in his pocket, that actual whistle. <coughs> That's uh, right. To remind him of those that were lost around him. Well, unless he had a better idea of how to work it than I uh, <laughs> he wouldn't have been getting much. Well, it must be quite old now, though. It must be a... Well, it's pre-1945 anyway. Right. Yeah, it's a long, long time uh, And ago. I mean, it's from the Indian time, so it would uh -huh. be late 20s, 30s. Right, right. Um, so... And the call of the lost is still there today. It is. You mm -hmm. know, and that's why it's it's such a privilege to be part of the work of ACRI and yeah. to see God at work uh, in Brazil as well as Portugal and, and yeah. in the Canary Islands. Certainly, we are so thrilled at what God's doing in Brazil today. And your mum and dad, their prayer way back then was that God would reach out 
to the the national people, the Brazilians, exactly. and save them and raise exactly. them up. And today we have no British missionaries really right. there in Brazil. They're all national workers. Yes. Well, Dad and Mum kind of hoped that they, they would be done out of a job, the missionaries, mm -hmm. that the nationals would take over. And certainly, as you say, in Brazil it's happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lanzarote, yeah, not yeah. quite uh, from Lanzarote, but, yeah, but from Colombia. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think that is wonderful. No, it's, it, as I say, it's great. You know, a lot of the towns and villages, I've been in a, a number of them, yes. you know, in Acre that your mum and dad would have been in and worked in, Rio yeah. Branco and uh, Boga do Acre, Sena Madureira, um, Feijó, Tarawaka, all of those towns. Mm -hmm. And still the work goes on today. That's right. And, and, and even bigger works yes, th than that, much, th much. than the early days, whenever it was yes. pioneer work. The great advantage of having nationals is they know the language. Mm -hmm. They're acclimated, they know the customs, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they've a head start That's right. over missionaries. Very much so. So it's, uh, it's yeah. wonderful. Uh, and in the northeast again, it's, it's amazing to see your mum and dad didn't know anything about the northeast oh, uh, because was it was a different, different world, yeah. really, to where they were. And yet the Lord has stepped in there and we have 10 or 12 mm. sets of workers there today yeah, and, yeah. and building churches. And it's so exciting to see what God's doing there as well, isn't it? Um, but um, amazing. Amazing to, to look back and to give thanks to the Lord for what God has done. Exactly. Down what through really the years. thrilled me was Araldo coming from Brazil mm -hmm. as a missionary to Portugal, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which was tremendous. And now they're sending missionaries all over the world. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of Brazilians have come to Portugal now. That's right. Uh, it's a very different world than Brazil. It's very hard and difficult there, yet uh, a lot are coming in and Mark and Judith, Mark was with us the other day sharing a wee bit about a lot of the Brazilian families that have come to the Algarve and have got involved with the Portuguese side of the work there, which is yeah. which is exciting to see as well. Yeah. Another thing that thrills me, and I'm sorry, but um, my great nephew has recently become engaged to a Portuguese girl mm -hmm. who led him to, well, got him going to church. She herself became a Christian and uh, got him going to church and he accepted the Lord. And I feel that's a lovely wee continuation. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying they're going to be missionaries under any circumstances, but it's just nice. Well, you never know. That uh, part of the family mm -hmm. is still connected with Portugal. Por the Portuguese, yes. yeah, yeah. Uh, Amazing. Yeah. And then, of course, you have many cousins and whatever in Brazil today as well. So yeah. the Macomb name goes on in Brazil. <laughs> it does, yes, it does. I, yeah. I have an obstetrician uh, cousin in, in Manaus mm -hmm. who has puzzled one or two British-speaking people who had their babies delivered by this Herbert Macomb. Uh -huh, so uh -huh. it's, uh, it's, it's still a nice connection, yeah. Well, thank you so much for allowing us to come to your home today and, and to, to do oh, this. Um, we really you. appreciate that. Thank you for asking uh, me. And we, we could talk all, all night well, about so much are, more. You're so right, couldn't Keith, we? I certainly We've just scratched the surface, really. Yes. But it's yeah. lovely. You know, I, I never met your mum and dad, but I no. feel I knew them uh, yes. because of the stories that we've heard about them. And I think you'd have got on awfully well with my father. Oh, uh -huh. very good. You would. Absolutely. Well... Yes. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, again, welcome. thank you for all your support to us. You've been a, a, you've been a member of the committee for many, many years and involved oh, yes. with just, the work just and a few. continue to pray for the yeah. work and the, worker, the workers. And we really do appreciate that well, so much. They have our prayers too. Yeah. So lovely. But thank you. Thank you. So thank you for listening tonight. Um, we really appreciate Eleanor and William allowing us into their home to share with us. And as I said, we've just scratched the surface. If you'd like to know a wee bit more about the work of Acre, uh, Victor Maxwell wrote this book, When God Steps In. Um, it's the history of the work, the story of Acre Gospel Mission. And you can find out an awful lot more about the mission in the book. If you'd like to get our regular prayer letter, um, please contact us. The new one is just coming out actually uh, this week. 
And if you'd like to get it, email us or um, give us a phone at the office and we'd love to get that sent to you as well, just to keep you a little bit more uh, update of the work of the mission. Thank you for listening and God bless you. Thank you. It is to this region and against this background that we in the Acre Gospel Mission have been called to hold forth the word of life. This call first came to Mr. William McComb many years ago. However, we'll let him tell us about this in his own words. Thank you. It was in 1927, while in the town of Manas on the river Amazon, that a vision of the needs of the territory of Acre were revealed to us. Two terms were spent among the Indians before this vision materialized. Mm -hmm. My wife uh, labored, my wife and I labored on the river Pindare with the Guajishara Indians. This demanded a journey of 10 days by canoe to get to their territory. It was in 1937 that the Lord opened the door for us to go to Acre. In company with Miss Molly Harvey, we landed in Rio Branco, the capital. We were not long there when we were informed of a tribe of Indians that had never heard the gospel, no missionary had ever been with them, and my wife and I decided at least to pay them a visit. We were away for three months. These Indians lived right away off the beaten tracks. We traveled for a week by lunch, then several days by canoe, and then one day over land to get to their territory. They were degraded and very much needed the gospel. Some of them spoke Portuguese, so they were enabled, they were enabled to interpret the message for others. Miss Harvey, in the meantime, remained in Rio Branco in company with a Christian family. There she had an opportunity of learning the language. Uh, the work in Rio Branco was blessed of the Lord. A church was formed with all the attendant activities. My wife, assisted by Molly Harvey, uh, had a wonderful women's meeting. This, in combination with maternity work and other activities, visitation, uh, was the means of numbers of these women coming to the church. Some of them accepted Christ. We were very happy about the work in the open air and in the prison. God blessed it and some of these prisoners who were murderers came to Christ. The work that gave us most joy was that of taking the gospel message along the rivers of the Acre. The Lord provided a launch for this in which we traveled hundreds of miles giving the glorious message. Some of the journeys took us as far as Bolivia and uh, uh, lasted seven weeks. We had the joy of giving to the people upwards of several hundred Bibles and Testaments, and we rejoice to know that these are being read today. Some of these people accepted Christ. I carry with me in my pocket a little object given by an old Indian chief, Maui Indian. It is termed by them the call of the lost. Each Indian carries it with him, and when he is lost in the forest, he blows it. It gives a very shrill sound, different from any bird or animal, and the Indian knows it. When he hears it, he will immediately go to rescue his lost brother. There's a call comes ringing from the Acre today, come over and help us.